Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to The Hub Today presents Mom to Mom. I'm Maria Sansone, and I am so excited for today's episode. You know, in a world where we are so obsessed with anti-aging, today we're gonna actually lean into aging. Don't be scared. What if instead of dreading getting older, we actually looked forward to it? Could the best truly be yet to come? My guest today says absolutely yes, and I am so here for that. He is an expert in the topic of aging. Chip Conley is the founder of the Modern Elder Academy. It is the world's first midlife wisdom school, and he is a New York Times bestselling author. So today we're going to dive into his latest book. It's called Learning to Love Midlife, 12 Reasons Why Life Gets Better with age, where he creates an alternative narrative to that dreaded midlife crisis and aging in general. So Chip, welcome to mom to mom I am so excited to chat with you. I'm a big fan of your work. I just think this is all so fascinating. Thank you, Maria. I, you know, who knew when I was 10 years old, I would be an aging expert someday, but I, I, I've come to become that at age 63. Um, and I'm thrilled that this book, uh, Learning to Love Midlife, has has found a very large audience um, of people who say, like, you know what? What if midlife's not a crisis? Yeah. Maybe what if it's actually an opportunity? Yeah. Well, like, why don't you give us the gist of this? From what I take from all of it is we're kind of reframing this concept of aging. And it's really something we've all been so resistant to. But yes. if we're not aging, we ain't living. Right? It's, that is, we, we that's exactly lean right. in. <laughs> so aging and growing are the same thing. But when you're 15 years old, you say, oh, my Johnny, have, you've grown so much in the last uh, year if you haven't seen him in a year. But no one says, hey, Chip, you know, you've been growing a lot at 63. And they're probably talking about my waistline. Right. But the bottom line is we grow and we age until we die. And um, what I really wanted to focus on with this book and also with MEA, the Modern Elder Academy, are... Um, our wis midlife wisdom school um, was to help people to see what gets better with age. That's why the subtitle is 12 reasons why life gets better with age. We're very clear what gets worse with age, mm -hmm. short term memory, the body generally gets worse with age. Um, but everything from emotional intelligence to wisdom, to spiritual curiosity, uh, to understanding your life narrative, there's a bunch of things that actually get better with age that I wanted to um, illuminate because we've had over 4,000 people come to our Baja campus and soon to be our Santa Fe, New Mexico campus wow. to do our MEA workshops. So what are some of the things that happen in the Modern Elder Academy? It seems like it's almost like we go to high school to prepare for life and to prepare for college, and now people are coming here. And what are the type of things that they're learning for the next chapter? Well, let's start with the name. So some people think, like, oh, it's the Modern Elderly Academy. No, it's the Modern Elder Academy. And the reason it's called that is because um, I was the modern elder to the three young founders of, of Airbnb. I was a boomer. They were millennials. They asked me to come in because I was a longtime boutique hotelier. And I spent seven and a half years helping them steer the rocket ship of that company to become the most uh, valuable hospitality company in the world. They called me a modern elder because they said, I'm as curious as I am wise. Hmm. And so the average age of the people who come to MEA, the Modern Elder Academy, is 54. So it's it's people who are solidly in midlife. And they're, the reason they come is often because they're navigating some transitions in our life. You, you, Maria, you were so right to say that adolescence is full of all kinds of transitions. And we have schools and tools and guidance counselors and parents to help you through that. But when you're going through menopause or a divorce or sandwich generation, taking care of aging parents and young kids at the same time, um, uh, ch you know, ca uh, career change, selling your business. There's a lot of things that happen in midlife. I, I found out I had um, stage three prostate cancer in midlife. And so wow. we're in the process of going through a lot of transitions, but we don't necessarily have schools or tools or rituals or rites of passage to help people through these. And that's why um, MEA exists with week-long programs um, in Baja, Mexico, and Santa Fe, but also with online programs as well. So I want to go back a little bit. Before you became an aging expert, you were an entrepreneur. And like you yep. started to say, you got involved with Airbnb. And your role yep. there was very interesting because you were kind of like an intern, but also kind of like a consultant. So you had this wisdom, but you were also fresh yeah. in the tech space. And they were calling you a modern elder. 
How were you comfortable with that? Because most people would take offense to that. How did you get comfortable yeah. in that space and then make that your life's work? So Maria, it's very interesting. For 24 years, I'd been one of the first boutique hoteliers in the US and started a company based in San Francisco that created 52 boutique hotels. And then I sold it in the, during the Great Recession. And so when I was asked by the founders of Airbnb at 52 to join them when the average age in the company was 26, I realized pretty quickly that I was in a new habitat <laughs> and I wasn't the CEO. I was the mentor to the CEO, Brian, who is 21 years younger than me. Um, and his two co-founders. Um, but I was as much an intern as I was a mentor. A, a mentor. So I called myself a mentor, mm -hmm. a mentor and an intern at the same time, because I was mentoring them on strategy and leadership and the hospitality and travel business. So, and often about EQ, emotional intelligence, but they were teaching me a lot of DQ, digital intelligence. Mm. And so we were both better off for it. It was like an intergenerational collaboration. And I wrote a book called Wisdom at Work, The Making of a Modern Elder about that experience, because guess what? Um, by next year, 2025, the majority of Americans will have a younger boss. So we need to actually learn how to work yes. across generations That's in true. the workplace. Now, is there a certain age in which you become a modern elder? Because in some ways, I feel a little bit like a modern elder in my workplace at 43. You could be. Well, you know what? You know, as an on 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 TV celebrity, you know, you are definitely maybe by 40, you're a modern certainly elder. A veteran. <laughs> yes. You know, Tom Brady, famous in Boston. You know, he was a modern elder as an NFL quarterback. Yeah. If you're a software engineer in Silicon Valley, um, at 35, you're a modern elder. If you're a fashion model at 30, you're a modern elder. So the bottom line is um, being an elder is a relative term. It means that you're older than the people around you and hopefully wiser. Yeah. Um, but it's different than being elderly, which is maybe the last five or 10 years of your life. So and yes, I, you I can be. I think that is going to be such a huge reframe for people. And I think that's why I was so excited when I stumbled upon this material is yes. what really blew my mind is I heard you say something about how when we're living so long now, luckily, you know, people are living 80, 90, 100. So if you're 40 yep. or 50 or even 60, you still have so much adult life ahead of you. And I think so yeah. many people kind of mentally throw in the towel in terms of curiosity and growing and learning and, you know, feeding our bodies and minds and all of that stuff because we're like, oh, we're just getting old. But there's so much Ma left. I love you, Maria. You, I, you've... you've <laughs> Read, read my book. You've seen my Today Show uh, um, interview. Yes. I mean, if you're 54, the average age of the person who comes to MEA, and you live till 90, 54 is exactly halfway between 18 and 90. Wow. And most people don't think they have half of their adult life still ahead of them at 54, if you start counting at age 18. So long story short is... Um, once you understand that you have, you have longevity literacy and that you have that much life ahead of you, you start to reimagine how you want to consciously curate that second half of your adult life. Yeah. And you bring with this so much because I've interviewed actually a lot of people over the years being a modern elder in broadcasting. <laughs> and I don't think I've ever talked to anyone who's died. So I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about that. Um, and how that has brought you to where you are today and some of your, the way that you frame all of this. Yeah. Well, this is the uh, oldest day you will ever have, you know, in your life until tomorrow. Right. And so we continue to clock our, our, our years and, and, and longevity is a real thing. I mean, the, we added 30 years of longevity in the 20th century in the United States. So prior to that midlife was sort of a figment of our imagina imagination because the average age that people died at was 47, which is solidly in what we would consider mo midlife today. Yeah. So midlife is a bridge between early adulthood and later adulthood, and it's a very long bridge. And what happened to you in your 40s that really like changed things? Oh man, I you know uh, Maria, I my my second half of my 40s were really difficult, and I now know something called the U curve of happiness that shows that. Um, 45 to 50 is the low point of life satisfaction um, on average globally. But it's not a crisis. It was just, I, I was going through a lot of difficult things at once, um, including having an NDE, dying from an allergic reaction uh, to an antibiotic and having to be shocked back to life nine, nine times in 90 minutes. So I, you know, a lot of things happen in our late forties when we sort of uh, disappointment equals expectations minus reality, meaning we have a lot of expectations and sometimes reality is not living up to that. 
And it's a time for, as my friend Brené Brown calls it, to do an unraveling of all those expectations so that you can reimagine how you want to live your life. Yes. Um, so it's a beautiful time. It can be. Interesting. All right. So for those of us in our early 40s, we are about to embark in a very scary place. That 45 to 50 can be a really down spot. So we're going to take a quick break. Your mileage may vary, my dear. My, That's you, true. Your mileage may vary. That's true. But we got to prepare for it. So That's more true. with Chip Conley. We're going to talk about expectations, I think, when we come back. Or who knows? <laughs> Wherever this goes. And welcome back to mom to mom I've been chatting with Chip Conley, author of Learning to Love Midlife. Who knew this conversation about aging could be so much fun? You know, we often think about all that we lose in midlife, but today Chip is really talking about how much we gain. And I think that's really, really exciting. But right before the break, we were talking about expectations and yeah. managing, I think, expectations during midlife is probably really important. How do you talk to the elders that you work with about disappointments that things maybe aren't working the way they used to? You can't find the word that you're looking for or your body's not cooperating the way that it used to. I think that probably that's a big topic. Yeah, I, you know, part of the reason why there is this U-curve of happiness and, and people's life satisfaction bottoms out around 45 to 50 is because of the fact that they had some hopes and aspirations and dreams and expectations, uh, sometimes entitlements <clears throat> that they thought were coming to them. And it, you know, whether it's, you know, maybe they didn't marry their soulmate or marry, maybe they are, you know, not um, the mayor of their city yet, or maybe they don't have a million dollars in the bank um, or maybe their kids aren't going to an Ivy, Ivy League school. So there's a lot of things that actually you have to get come face to face with. You also come face to face with mortality, you know, often in, around, you know, your late 40s and early 50s, because you're dealing with your your parents and maybe friends um, who have had a, a difficult um, health diagnosis. So um, the most important thing for people to sort of get comfortable in is their own skin. Just as you got comfortable in your own skin, it started to sag. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but what that means is, one of the things that's beautiful about midlife is social science research shows that it's starting around 45 to 50, we start to care less about what other people think about us. Yeah. We start to care more about what matters to us. And that's particularly true for women. So let's talk about this about, around women, because for women as caregivers and as you know, trying to fit in and trying to, you know, be, you know, the person that everybody likes. Um, yeah. Men sometimes don't care about that. People Women pleasers. care about it a lot more. People, People pleasers. pleasers, exactly. Yeah. There's an element around 45 to 50. Again, social science research on this has been, uh, bears this out, where you start to realize it's time for you, as what, what we call it, the MEA, the great midlife edit. Mm. You start to edit the ways of being and the mindsets and maybe even the people in your life that maybe aren't working out for you so well. Um, and you start to actually get clear about what does matter to you yes. and who matters to you. And you get more discerning, you know, in a form of wisdom, discernment, you start to get more discerning about how you spend your time. Uh, and that's partly because as we get older, you get clearer that you only have so much time left. Now, at 45, you know, in, in your case, in your early 40s, you have a lot of time left. You probably have 50 to 60 years left based upon um, how longevity is growing. But the bottom line is you get more clear about you don't want to waste your time. Yeah. You know, we don't we don't like to waste our money. But I think in midlife time and beyond, we don't want to waste our time. No. And so learning how to get clear about what is important to you and then editing out everything else is something that happens in midlife. There was something you said, I was listening to you on a podcast and I was walking. I want to make sure I got this right. Cause you said it and I was like, I didn't have anything to write anything down, but I was like, Oh yes, this, you were talking about how early in life we make decisions with our ego. And then as we get yes. older, the decision-making process comes from another place. It comes from like the soul. And that to me yeah. felt so profound because I'm noticing a shift, you know, like I just had my foot on the gas for so long and I would not yeah. let up. And all of a sudden I'm letting up a little bit 
at this in this season of my life and it's an unusual feeling but it's coming from like a different place and I feel like you yeah. nailed it so can you talk about that a little bit thank you well, there's a guy named Richard Rohr, a famous Christian mystic based in New Mexico. He's actually on our MEA faculty. He's also an MEA alum. Um, and, you know, last name's R-O-H-R. Many of your your viewers probably know who he is. Um, he's a good friend of mine. And he said to me, Chip, you know, the first half of our life, the thing that actually propels us forward, the thing that differentiates us, the thing that individuates us from our family, um, and the, the primary operating system of our life is really our ego. And, and then at some point in our forties, we sort of see it, it gets out of control sometimes mm -hmm. and start, something starts to actually awaken in, in our belly, in our, you know, in our, in our, in our soul. And what's awakening is your soul. It's, it's been sort of, it, it, it's almost like in ballroom dancing. I learned to ballroom dance when I was in sixth grade and the boy, the boy leads the dance and the girl follows in, in heels going backwards. It's around midlife that all of a sudden the soul starts leading the dance Ooh. and the ego has to be in, in, in heels going backwards. And, and the ego, you better have a sense of humor for the e ego because it's not used to doing that. Right. But what starts to come is this feeling of a curiosity about meaning and purpose and maybe a little bit of a newfound religious or spiritual um, awakening. And, you know, it, there's... For a lot of people, that's when they start to read self-help books and they start to read um, spiritual books. Um, and for many people, it's a time where they start to get more interested in something bigger than themselves. And and that's true. To be honest with you, if you've got kids, and of course this show is all about that, if you've got kids, you've you've had to have be about something other than yourself because you've had to take care of your kids. Yeah. Um, so I actually think this is sometimes more true for men than for women um, because of the fact that women are giving so much already. Yeah, we really are. So in this country, it feels like in particular here in the United States that we have a, we don't treat our elders with the respect that they get in some other countries where they're really revered and they are legends in their community and they are tapped into for their knowledge and wisdom and whether they're showing people how to cook or garden or whatever it is that, you know, they're tapping into that. Here in our country, it feels like we're not doing that. There's a lot of old age homes and things like that. What are we doing wrong here and how can we do better? And I know there's probably like a whole other half hour discussion, that, but there is. I mean, what's our problem? Have, Maria, you ask great questions. Um, the truth is we have age apartheid in the United States. And what do I mean by that? I mean, we sort of segregate by ages. You know, you... You learn till you're 20 or 25, you earn till you're 60 or 65, and then you adjourn or retire till you die. And and what that leads to is uh, less intergenerational collaboration. This is particularly true in Caucasian society in the United States. In um, in people of colors, uh, communities and families, there's often multi-generational living, more so than in um, in white families. But what that means is that we really miss out on this opportunity to learn from each other. And, and the learning can go in both directions. In the past, it might have been like, oh, all of the w the wisdom is held by the elders. Well, that's not true today. I mean, I, I don't know how my phone works very well, <laughs> but but my sons do and my, um, my nieces and nephews do. Um, and so I learn from them as much as maybe they learn from me. But we as a society have not have have really thought of um, elders as somebody who need to be warehoused as they get older um, or put in the White House. <laughs> warehoused or White House. <laughs> oh, I like that. <laughs> um, not, we're not going there. But like, you know, the, 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 the truth, the truth is that um, generally speaking, we, we've moved from an agricultural society to an industrial society to a technological technological society. And as we went from agricultural to tech. We moved away from the kind of wisdom that a farmer would have about the land and the weather that they learned over the course of time. So, um, and so some of the wisdom that you know in the workplace that we used to sort of say, "Oh, that's great," um, is is less important. What people forget about, though, is it you know the workplace is full of people, and as you get older, you get smarter about yourself and other people. And so sometimes the the best people in a company to put on a team are the older workers who are less competitive with the younger workers and are able to be compassionate and understanding of other people on the team. Now that that's not everybody. I mean, but on average, 
emotional intelligence and emotional reactivity. Um, goes and up. it goes up. Exactly. Yeah. Reactivity goes down. Emotional intelligence goes up. Well, that's something to look forward to. <laughs> All right, we're going to yeah. take a quick break. More with Chip Conley, not just about aging gracefully, but aging with excitement when we come back. Yeah. Welcome back to Mom to Mom. The man that has mastered loving midlife is here. His name is Chip Conley. We've been having this great conversation. So right before the break, we were talking about how valuable older people can actually be in the workplace, contrary to some popular belief. Um, but I wanted to talk yep. to you before we go about retiring, because you have an interesting take on retirement. Yeah, I, I think part of the reason why retirement is less favored today than, say, 30 years ago is because more of the workplace is, is knowledge workers. And so, you know, when you're 60 or 62 and you're being told maybe you have to retire or forced retirement in some companies, um, you're feeling like, my brain is still working. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Whereas when, when you're a factory worker and you were doing backbreaking work, at 60 or 62, you definitely wanted to give that up. It was mind-numbing and backbreaking. And so um, I think that it's not about retirement as much as it's about regeneration. And so at MEA, we've created regenerative communities, not retirement communities, but a place where people can regenerate themselves and live next to a regenerative farm. And, and it's, it's quite beautiful because I, I really do believe that um, we have so much to offer as we get older um, and to actually retire at 62 when you're going to live till 92 is sort of silly and and frankly, not fiscally sound yeah. because a lot of us need to work by choice or necessity, maybe into our 70s and beyond. Yeah, especially knowing what we know now about how important having a purpose is. As we yes. age and get older, we had Dan Butner on the show, which I'm sure you're familiar with his work and the Blue Zones. Dan, your friend. He's my friend. He's on our faculty and we do Blue Zones workshops at MEA. OK, yes. <laughs> I'm seeing so many parallels there. And so we know how important having that purpose is as you get older. And for many of us, we find our purpose through work. So to let that all go is right. not a great idea. You know, you got to keep it going. Well, it's interesting. So the mortality rate um, increases or by two years when you when you retire. Um, so it accelerates your mortality. And there's, again, data on this as well. So I'm not saying that people shouldn't retire. I think that to go from working 100% on a Friday to 0% on a Monday yeah. is not the only option. You can you can start to actually scale down. You can become have a portfolio career where you have multiple different uh, pieces of work that make you money or give you a sense of purpose. Yeah. If there's one thing I know to be true, or at least that I believe it's bodies in motion, stay in motion. And yes, I've do. always said that my grandparents lived to be almost a hundred and I really watched what they did and I've tried to figure out what it is. I talked about this with Dan, but they just never stopped moving until they stopped. <laughs> you know what I mean? Officially. Hey, you don't have to be in a gym. It's nope. natural movement, it, as Dan has shown. I mean, the people who live to 100 in Sardinia do not have nope. a 24-hour fitness um, <laughs> near them. So, you know, it, it, there's natural things you can do to actually make yourself happier. And the most important thing you can do to living a healthy, happier life is to actually have great relationships. All right. Invest well, we made one today. Chip, thank you, thank you. so much. I could go you. on and on with you. Thank you so much for your time today. This was a great conversation. Make sure you check out Chip Conley and all his work wherever you find books. And don't forget, you can keep up on all things mom to mom wherever you listen to your podcast. All you have to do is scan the QR code that you see here on the screen. It'll take you right where you need to go. That does it for us today. I'll see you next time. Age gracefully. Age. It means we're living. <laughs> and age gratefully, too. And gratefully. Thank you, Chip. <laughs>